Chapter 6. La mano. Dame la mano, hermanita, que no tengo hermano. The hand. Give me a hand, little sister, for I don't have a brother. It was almost 10 at night by the time we finally arrived in El Sacrificio. The town was smaller than we'd expected. In fact, it wasn't really a town. El Sacrificio was no more than a few dozen houses clustered around the country road we'd been traveling on since we turned east on Highway 57. At a puestecito, a corner store about to close down for the evening, I got out of the car and asked an elderly man who was sweeping the storehouse porch if he knew how to get to the dead man's home. The old man squinted and looked toward the car before he answered. He would have been better off staying gone, the old man said, pointing to the car with his chin. What? I asked. He opened the door and placed the broom against the inside wall. He has no business being here today. What does he want to do? Ruin that poor girl's day? What do you mean? I asked, confused. Do you know him? Of course I do. Everyone knows each other around here, the elderly man said as he took a rag out of his apron and began to wipe down the metal domino tables folded out by the front door. He's a good for nothing un vego, but that, that's none of my business. Flower from a different sack, as far as I'm concerned. Well, do you know how to get there? I asked again. But instead of answering me, the store owner turned away and left me standing there. Then he went to the tiny depot, closed the door, and came to the window to pull down in the shade. A moment later, the porch light went out and I stood there, wondering what I had done wrong. You're almost there, a woman's voice whispered from the darkness. I turned around and almost jumped at the sight of a female figure coming out of the shadows from behind the storehouse, like a ghost. God, you scared me, I said, holding my, a hand to my chest as if to stop my heart from, from fluttering out of it. You've come a long way, the woman whispered as she inched her way toward me never really leaving the shadows of the porch, but getting closer and closer to me until I could finally see her face. I'm proud of you, Odelia. Yorona, I whispered her name in grateful recognition. You're almost there, she continued. Just follow the sound of the whispering moon. Listen to her sighs. It's a small pink house. You can't miss it tonight. Wait, I said as she started to drift back into the shadows. Is this part of your destiny to watch over us? Help us when we need you? I'll be watching you as you deliver him and afterward too, said La Llorona said. But I cannot interfere with your journey. These are the rules that must be followed and I will not be able to break them. There is only so much I will be able to do. The rest is up to you. You must face your own fears and fight your own battles as you go along. That is why I gave you the ear pendant. Fight my own battles, I asked. What are you talking about? I'd battled too much with my sisters on this trip already. I was ready for some peace. I've said too much. It's not for me to explain, La Llorona whispered. She turned away and disappeared into the darkness, leaving me alone with her cryptic words. But I didn't have time to decipher their meaning. I had to get out of the, air, the night air. El mal air can kill you if you linger in it too long. So I turned away from the Puestecito, got in the car, and drove on, trying to finish what we had started that morning. As we left the cluster of houses behind, I looked up at the moon and tried listening to her sighs. I wasn't sure it was the moon that sighed, but I could hear something, a wisp of music, a whisper of song. What's going on, Juanita asked when I stopped the car and poked my head out the window, trying to hear where the soft sound was coming from. I held my hand up with my palm out, signaling Juanita to stop talking. Shh, listen, I said. It's coming from over there. La Llorona had been right. There was no way of missing the pink house, not with a party going on in the front yard. A small mariachi band was playing in the background and people were either dancing on the lawn or sitting at folding chairs at small round tables, which had been draped with white linens and decorated with white floral arrangements. Juanita leaned over me for a closer look out my window. 
what do you think is going on? I don't know, some kind of fiesta, I whispered. I passed the house and inconspicuously parked next door, just in front of their neighbor's fence, <clears throat> away from the lights strung on trees all around the dead man's yard. The dimness of the night hid us from the guests, and we, we sat quietly inside our vehicle, observing everything from a dark, safe distance. I think someone's having a wedding, Valia pointed. See, there's the bride sitting at the long table by the band. That's not a wedding dress, Juanita said. We all peered out, the car, out of the car without making an, any attempt to get out. I don't think any of us had the courage to crash a party by delivering a dead man to it. It's not, Valia asked. No, I said, suddenly understanding. A cold chill went up my spine as I realized what was going on at the drowned man's house. There's no groom. Then why is she in a white dress? Peta's voice from the back seat was small and innocent. Because it's her 15th birthday, I whispered. It's a quinceanera. Who's quinceanera? Peta asked. The girl in the picture, Valia whispered. The girl in the picture, Dahlia asked, horrified. You mean, she's not little anymore? We were all dumbfounded at the realization that the dead man's daughter was not a child anymore, but a young lady my own age. How could we proceed with such a different, a different reality from the one we'd imagined? It was like our dreams were shattered. The girls looked disillusioned. I was more than shocked. I was dumbstruck. Presented with the current situation, I didn't know what to do, how to proceed. Juanita pointed to the celebration taking place in the dead man's front lawn. We have to get out of here. We can't ruin her special day, she said, shaking me out of my stupor. Shush, keep it down. We don't want to call attention to ourselves. Not yet, anyway. I bit my fingernails and tried to figure out the best way to handle the situation. We could leave, of course, but where could we go? What could we do that didn't involve taking the dead man with us? We have to do something. We can't just sit here and eat our hands, Valia said, knocking my hand away from my face. She was just like Mama, who didn't believe in biting your nails, no matter what the circumstance. I don't know, I admitted. Going up to the house at this time would be more than inappropriate. It would be downright mean to ruin someone's debut. I think we should get out first, Dahlia said. No, we need to talk first, I said, turning around to look right at the twins as I spoke. Listen, when we get in there, they're going to have lots of questions for us, but we have to be smart and have each other's back. We can't just blurt things out anymore like you did at the bridge. Water break, hold on. Juanita turned around in her seat and looked at Peta specifically. Yeah, we've come a long way. We can't afford to blow it now. So you guys have to follow the rules of the Cinco Hermanitas. Let Odelia and I do the talking and don't contradict anything we say. And for God's sake, don't improvise. Too, too much cream spoils the tacos. So just keep it simple, okay? Fine, whatever, Valia said, slapping her hand dismissively in front of Juanita's face. Can we get out now? I really have to pee. Does anyone else have to pee, need to pee? I have to pee, Peter piped up, squirming around in the back seat. Stop fooling around. You can't just go up there and ask to use their restroom. They don't know us from Adam, I whispered. But the commotion was only going to draw more attention to us. But I do have to pee, Peter started rocking back and forth like she couldn't hold it for one more second. I rolled my eyes and ignored her. Stop whining and be quiet, I said after a few seconds of further complaints. I need to think and we should all keep a low profile until I figure out what to do. Maybe we should just drive away, Dahlia whispered behind me. Come back later when the party's over. We can find a store where we can use the restroom. Are you kidding, Dahlia hissed? We're in Mexico and those are real Mexicans in there. These people can party till dawn. Not to mention the stores we'd driven by had been dark, locked up like the Puestecito. And our last resort would be to go in the woods. For this single, for this one single thing, the twins just wouldn't rough it. 
So we always rode up to the nearest gas station to use the restroom when we were swimming. Well, we can't sit here all night waiting for the party to end, Celia told her twin. I don't know about you, but Papa here is stinking up the car. Seriously, he's giving me a headache. I don't smell anything, I said, to prove it. To prove it, I took a deep breath. It was all I could do not to gag. The smell of death had been festering in the afternoon heat, and now it was unbearable. I say we find a place to park for the night. And by that, I mean, get a room somewhere, Valia said, reaching over the front seat and touching my shoulder for a sign of concession. Yeah, like that's gonna happen, Juanita said. Did you see the size of this place? They don't even have a gas station here. We'd have to go back out to the highway if we wanted to find a motel. We turned around to look at Valia in the back seat. And how would we move the body into a room without calling attention to ourselves? It's not like we can leave him in the car all night in the parking lot. Let's face it, going to a motel is out of the question and nothing else is open this late. I think you're stuck sitting next to him until the, this party's over. He doesn't smell so bad, Peta said, pinching her nose. I think the perfume is working. I had to admit it. Juanita's right, I said. We can't get a room, not until after we've delivered him. We could go back into the woods, camp out, wait until morning, Juanita suggested as she stifled a yawn, laid her head back and closed her eyes. I'm not going to sleep in the woods at night. I'm not a goat, Dahlia retorted. Next thing you know, you'll be expecting me to sleep in a barn with the horses and hay and God knows what else. And Lechuzas? You want those evil owls climbing all over you while you sleep, pecking your eyes out? Dahlia teased. Dahlia teased Dahlia in the back seat. Shut up, Dahlia retorted, pushing, her, pushing at her twin's shoulder. I don't believe in that stuff. Of course you don't, Dahlia continued. How about vampires and werewolves? You believe in those? As if on cue, an enormous animal ran up to the car and jumped into the driver's side, uh, up onto the driver's side door. He stuck his gigantic head in through the window and barked wildly. Dahlia and Dahlia screamed. I jumped in my seat, throwing my left arm out to protect my face. The drooling long-eared beast sniffed me and then yelped and clawed his way inside through the driver's side window. I couldn't see all of him at once. That's how enormous this beast was. He had to be as big as me, but much heavier. His huge paws dug into my arms and thighs, his claws painfully cutting through my skin. He was so excited, he punched me in the stomach with a mammoth paw as he pulled the rest of his enormous body into the car. I would have doubled over in pain, except that his weight was plastering me against my seat. Get him off of me, get him off of me, I screamed, but nobody could help. Juanita in the front seat was busy trying to get away from the beast, a great Dane. In his excitement, the dog sniffed our clothes and licked our faces so frantically, you'd think the frenzied creature had three heads. Finally, the beast made his way over me and jumped into the back seat, which by that time only held the drowned man because the fear had set the rest of my sisters into motion. They had all, vacated the car long before I was free from the dog and able to open my door and crawl out. As I stumbled up to Juanita, Peta scooted over me and clung to my waist, trying to hide behind me. We stood against the chain link fence in the front of the dead man's neighbor's house, watching the gargantuan canine panting and licking his chops and whining inside the car. He sat next to the drowned man with his enormous paws neatly propped together on the dead man's lap his tail wagging a mile a minute. Great, so much for keeping a low profile. Now I'm going to smell like a wet diaper, Dahlia said, mopping over her saliva slathered hair with the hem of her t-shirt. Her, her actions reminded me of my own condition and I wiped at my face with my shirt sleeve. It was disgusting. Do we have any of that perfume left? I asked. Yeah, Juanita said without looking at us, but it's in my bag next to Mar Marmaduke's evil twin. You want to get it? Serbu Burus, the voice and a 
and a pitched whistle produced by the tall figure of a young man at the gate of the drowned man's house made the mammoth canine stiffen in the back seat. Go home, Cerberus, the young man commanded. Cerberus, like the three-headed dog from Hades? Dahlia looking at me. Well, he's right about one thing. He's got a hell of a personality, but I'm not sure, so sure, I'm not so sure he's fierce enough for that name. I know, he's nothing more than a big spoiled puppy, the young man said, stepping forward, as if he'd been a circus beast trained to behave like a domesticated creature. The mammoth dog left the dead man's side and slipped out of our car through the opposite rear window. He came around the car and sat docilely by the young man, waiting for his reward. The young man patted his forehead and pointed up the street, saying, go home, Sir Bruce. To our surprise, the dog trotted off into the darkness. Are you okay, ladies, sir? The young man asked as he peered at the body of the drowned man sitting in the sitting propped against the glass of the back window. He's fine, Juanita jumped in. The dog owner stepped up to the car and reached for the back door. What's wrong with him? He's not feeling well, Valia explained, getting between the young man and the car door just in time to prevent a catastrophe. He's dead, tired, Delia interjected. She laughed nervously and shuffled her feet around. It wasn't the time to blurt out the real reason behind our arrival at the house. It's been a long trip, I said, trying to deviate the conversation away from the drowned man. Forgive me, I'm being rude. I have not introduced myself. My name is Efrain Perdido. I am sorry about my abuelito's dog. He meant you no harm, the young man said. Excuse me, but I didn't catch your names. Are you friends of Beatrice? Beatrice, Juanita asked, looking toward the house. La Quintanera, she's my sister, Efrain explained, <clears throat> putting his hand on his chest and bowing his head slightly as a form of introduction. I looked closely at the wide set eyes and the square jawline of the young man. He looked vaguely like the little boy in the picture in Gabriel Perdido, Perdido's wallet, which weighed me down as I thought of the distressing news we were bearing. Dressed formally as he was in a black tuxedo, it was obvious that he was part of the debut court, the escort of one of the birthday girls attendants perhaps. It became very clear to me that we couldn't finish what we'd started that morning. Not yet, anyway. We're more like friends of the family, I started, but we've come at a bad time. We'll be back tomorrow. Nonsense, the young man said, raising his arms in exaggerated welcome. A fiesta is the best time to greet friends of the family. My sister's quinceanera is turning out to be quite a reunion. We just met some cousins from Sabina's today, but you have not told me your names. We are the Garza sisters, Juanita began. This is Odelia, she's the eldest, and this is Delia, and that's Velia. <clears throat> They're twins. The little one is Pizza, and I'm Juanita. Listen, can we use your restroom? We've been holding it for a while. Of course, of course, Efrain said, extending his arm and stepping aside so that we might pass into the front yard. You are welcomed at our, at our festivity. Tell me, how do you know our family? Well, we don't know anyone else, just him, I said, pointing to the drowned man and then looking back at the girl in the white dress. She was walking around with her mother, clinging to her arm, happily greeting the guests. A voice from the darkness spoke. Efrain, who are you talking to? We all turned around to see an older man coming toward us. He was wearing black jeans, a nice pressed shirt with a bejeweled bolo tie and a cowboy hat. He was too old to be part of the debut court. He was obviously not a, cham a chamberlain or an escort, but the authority in his voice made me think he was someone of importance. These girls just arrived. They're from your side of the family, I think, Abuelo. The young man said, turning around, face the other man. Really? The older man said. Let me see. You look like my nieces from Nava. 
but I haven't seen you since you were baby little things. Is that my comp compadre in there? Before we could stop him, the older man was stooped over, holding onto the front door window, looking into the back seat of our car. He started to say something, and then suddenly he stopped. Well, the young man asked. Madre de Dios, the older, older man whispered, still looking into the back seat of our car. Gabriel, is that you? Gabriel, the young man in the tuxedo asked, leaning forward to peer into the car again. It can't be. Inus, the old man, turned around and started shouting toward the house. Inus, Inus, hija mia. <clears throat> we stood huddled by the fence, dreading the inevitable, as we watched both the quinceanera and her mother freeze in their tracks. The music stopped, and both mother, oops, lost my place, and both mother and daughter turned around and looked at the ma old man as he yelled, Inus, my daughter, listen to me, Miha. Gabriel is home. Inus, your husband is home. As if we were all in a B-rated movie, the time seemed to stand still. I froze, unable to think. How could I warn them without making it worse? To my horror, everyone stopped talking and looked at the mother of the birthday girl. She stood rigidly, holding her daughter's shoulders with both hands, as if to stop herself from fainting. Then, silently, slowly, Inus Perdido, wife of Gabriel Perdido, and mother of his two children, walked quietly past men, women, and children as if she were in a trance. She made her way toward our dusty old car with her daughter trailing behind her. The older man held out his arms to her and Inus went into them instinctively. Efrain, the young man in the tuxedo, took the birthday girl in his arms and they all stood looking expectantly at the car door as if waiting for the pass to hit them in the face when it opened. The guests who had left their tables and chairs to follow Inus and her daughter out to the car, crowded behind the fence, quietly waiting for the night's drama to come, come to a head. Is it really him? Inus asked, her voice small and faint. See, sí, Miha, it's him. The old man held his daughter against his chest and, and nodded. He sucked in a breath and smothered a, wimpa, a whimper. No llores, Miha, the old man said, stroking her hair as he begged her not to cry. Efrain's voice quivered with emotion. Mama, is it really him? After all these years, is that really Papa? It doesn't look like him. Papa, the birthday girl whimpered. No, no, it can't, it, it, he can't do this to me. Not now, not tonight. Beatrice, Miha, Ines start, started her voice quivering, quivering with emotion. It's just, just like him, isn't it, Mama? Beatrice continued anger streaking her face with tears, just like him to ruin everything. Beatrice, por favor, Inus begged, reaching out to take her daughter into her arms. Beatrice fought off her mother's embrace. He should have stayed gone, Beatrice sobbed. I hate him, mom, I hate him. Please make him leave, I hate him. Beatrice, Inus continued in her quivering voice. He is your father. He has a right to be here. Please don't deny him that. Inus finally gathered her daughter in her arms, visibly trembling herself now. She looked at the car again, her eyes narrowing. Why doesn't he get out? What's wrong with him? He can't, I said from my place at the fence. It's not that he can't. He won't. He's a coward, Efrain spit out, clenching and unclenching his hands. Listen, I started, there's something you should know. I stepped toward Efrain, but he was faster than me. Get out, you coward, Efrain Perdido screamed at his father. Then, without hesitation, he lifted the door handle and yanked the door open. No, I screamed, don't do that. Belia and Delia finished my thought, but they were too late. To everyone's horror, the pillow cradling the drowned man's head slid down the glass and Gabriel Perdido's body tipped over sideways, falling onto the cement sidewalk with his arms outstretched before him in full rigor mortis. 
the birthday girl's head fell back and her body went limp. The crowd behind us gasped and Peta screamed. Several of the guests moved quickly toward Beatrice, but her grandfather reached her just in time to stop her, her head from hitting the edge of the curved driveway. Efrain helped his grandfather carry his sister into the house with Inus and a slew of gabbing quinceanera attendants following close behind them. My sisters and I waited by the fence with the rest of the guests who stood around the body speculating about Gabriel's return. While everyone around us talked about the tragedy and asked themselves where he had been, the old man came back down the driveway to inspect the body of his daughter's estranged husband. When he was done, his face looked pale and drawn. He stood on the sidewalk and looked at us with haunted eyes. After a moment, he said, Compadres, please help me get my son-in-law into the house. He must be given his own measure of respect. It appears that our birthday celebration has turned into a wake. Please, if you could help me, amigos. Of course, a man said as he stepped out of the crowd to help. Claro que si, another whispered as he too stepped forward. At your service, came the replies of several male guests as they stood beside Inus's father. As six men lifted the body of the drowned man, and started to carry him toward the house, the people around us started asking questions. How did we know Gabriel? Why did it take him so long to return? Where had he been all these years? Was he involved with our mother or aunt or our sister? In response to the last question, we shook our heads. But other than that, we kept our, our mouths shut. I was glad the girls were heeding my advice not to, not to embellish because at that moment, nothing we could have said would have made things better for them. Instead of talking to the guests, we walked up to the porch and stood waiting to hear from the family. They probably have more questions for us than the guests, and it would be rude of us to leave without filling them in on what little we did know. Besides, we're in a foreign country and we needed help finding a place to stay for the night. It seemed like an eternity before anyone came out of the house. In the meantime, Juanita and I sat on an old bench with Pita between us, while Delia and Velia clung to a pillar, trying their best not to wet their pants. Eventually, the old man came out of the house and spoke to everyone. Amigos, he said to the crowd, it is my sad duty to inform you that the festivities are over. Inus and I have some delicate business to attend to. Gabriel's body must be prepared for burial. You may return in the morning for the velorio, the viewing, which will be held here. Please feel free to take home as much food as you'd like. You are welcome to it. Then he turned around and spoke to the mariachi on the other side of the yard. Senores musicos, thank you for your service. You are free to go, senoritas he said, turning to address us. If you follow me, my Ines would like to speak to you. The body of Gabriel Perdido was laid out in full view on top of the dinner table, surrounded by the glow of dozens of gloomy candles. We peered at it as we escorted into the we were escorted into the house. Ines Perdido was sitting up primly on the edge of a cushioned chair in the parlor area directly across from the dining room next to an older woman who looked a lot like her. Inus's hands were clasped in front of her, clutching a rosary. She had taken her pink party dress off and was now wearing a modest black sheath that covered most of her body, except her forearms, hands, and ankles. She looked prettier in her party dress. I'm sorry we haven't been properly introduced, Inus said, as she extended a hand to us. I am Inus Perdido, and this is my mother, Zaragoza. We all shook hands. Glad to meet you, I whispered as we sat down before the two women. If we'd known about the quinceanera, we would have waited. We're sorry, Valia began. 
but Ines waved the apology away. She presented an embroidered handkerchief against the corners of her eyes and looked away. Where has he been? She asked when she had composed herself enough to manage words. We don't know, I said. He was already dead when we found him. Floating in the river, Dahlia interjected. It only took a few minutes to tell Ines everything we knew. After she heard the extent of our story, she sat still, quietly blinking away the tears of a lifetime of pain running down her pretty face. He sent a letter, she finally said, her, her voice low and deep with emotion many years ago, saying he wouldn't be back. I'm sorry, I said, we didn't know. I sent him a letter too, begging him to come home for his children's sake. They missed him so much, but he never wrote back. For a while, I thought maybe he had, he had married again, like so many men who go up north do, Ines whispered, looking down at her hands as she spoke, as if the memory of it was too painful to speak of, of in a normal tone of voice. Then the authorities came. They said they had found the remains of a body in his vehicle in the Chihuahuan Desert. They thought it might be him, but they couldn't be certain. The car was registered in his name and there were other signs, a gun and two rifles he had bought several months before, which were in the trunk. I don't know who that man was, but it never felt right them declaring Gabriel legally dead when they couldn't identify his body. At least now you know for he's gone for sure, Miha, Ines's father said as he stepped into the room. Gabriel was never really here, Ines continued in her trance-like voice. He was always roaming, always wandering. I think some men are just meant for the road. They have no sense of sense of place or belonging, no concept of family. Anyway, he's home now, finally, and I thank you for that. I'm sorry we ruined your daughter's special day, Juanita said, hanging her head and looking down at her hands. Don't be sorry, Ina said, patting Juanita's head. You have brought peace to my home. Peace, exactly what we had hoped to bring. Her words confirmed it, but her face denied it, and all and we could all see it. She was miserable.